California, on behalf of standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you need the kind of help you couldn't get from a cautious man, then you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, you may have forgotten the one time we met. You were the best man at my wedding. Yes, I'm Joe Burke's wife. You won't believe what's happened to him. Easy going, happy go lucky Joe. It's a pitiful mental case, and they've got him in a sanitarium. You were so close to Joe in the army, I thought maybe if he's. Well, you again, it might do more than the doctors have been able to do. I thought of this when I saw your ad in the paper, like a ray of hope. Won't you try to help me? It signed anxiously, Laura Burke. Joe, a mental case? Oh, no, not the Sergeant Burke I knew. Well, George's wife would hardly make up anything like this. But Brooksy at Palermo, when everybody else was either cussing or praying, that hard-headed Irishman just sat around playing a harmonica. Danny boy. It's funny I never heard you talk about him. Well, you know how those things are, Angel. You swear on your G.I. dog tag that you're going to be sure to keep in touch with each other, but... As Tempest fugits, all anxiety becomes just the name of a song. But you were his best man. This kid, Laura, came down to camp. We hopped the jeep over to the chaplain, and it took 15 minutes for the tender vows. A minute for me to kiss the bride, and they were off. All Joe had was a 48-hour pass. Mm, Dolly, she sounds so desperate in this letter. Yeah. What's that address, Brooksy? We'd better get right over there. <laughs> Only one chance in a thousand. I had to turn to you, Mr. Valentine. The name is George, remember? He's in that place, getting worse every day. How he doesn't even recognize me. Laura, we do want to help you. But, honey, you're making it so much harder. Here, sit down. I'm sorry. I know this is tough on you, Laura, but try to tell us the whole thing from the beginning. How did this happen to Joe? When? Well, about a month ago, they brought him home from Egypt. Egypt? What was he doing there? Well, after he got out of the army, he got a job with an export company, Kessling Limited. The money was so good he couldn't refuse it. He planned to keep it for two years so so we could put some money aside. Oh, it must have been terrible being separated again. Did Joe uh, begin to lose his grip while he was abroad? Oh, he sent letters regularly, wonderful, cheerful letters about the future. And a couple of months ago, he stopped writing. Yes, Laura? And then and one day he walked in with Dr. Tarouk. Oh, wait a minute, who's Dr. Tarouk? Some kind of psychiatrist the company sent back with Joe to take care of him. Mr. Kessling, he's the president of the company, he's been very kind. What did they say happened? Some kind of explosion outside the city. Joe happened to be around, and when he came to in the hospital, he... he, he... Now, take it easy, Laura. Hey, you want to knock off and have a cup of coffee? No, go on, I'm all right. I'll never forget it. Dr. Tarouk left us alone for a minute. Joe just stood there, right where you are, looking at me, looking through me. He tried to talk, but it seemed to hurt too much, so he just kept staring, staring. Oh, George. Yeah. He took a box of face powder from his pocket and handed it to me. Powder? I guess he managed to care. So pathetic. A box of teapot. Horrible to watch. Okay, Laura. I think we've heard enough to begin with. Uh, where have they got Joe? The Hillcrest Sanitarium. His company's paying all the expenses, and Dr. Zarouk says in time he hopes Joe will be all right. Yeah. But he's getting worse, you see. I thought if you saw him and talked to him, maybe... Maybe by some miracle he'd begin to remember things. He thought so much of I him. know. All right, Laura. You want to come along with us? No, I... I always seem to upset him. Okay. Yeah, Claire and I will drop in on Joe. And he's hoping it'll do some good. A sanitarium should have peace and quiet. But they should build it where people can find it. Yes, it is out of the way. Gosh, and every time I look down in that valley, I get dizzy. Kind of unusual, isn't it, Brooksy? What? A company going to quite so much trouble for one of their people. Sanitarium special psychiatrist who seems to stay on and on. Well, darling, maybe the milk of human kindness doesn't curdle as easily as most people think. Uh, maybe not. Brooksy, I've been in some tough spots. But I think seeing Joe like this is going to be just about the toughest. In dealing with...
keep in mind, Mr. Valentine. One is never sure what will be good or bad for the patient. Yeah, I think I know what you mean, Dr. Turk. Perhaps this visit from a dear friend out of the past may do Mr. Burke a world of good. However, on the other hand... Will we be able to see him soon? In a few moments. But perhaps it would be wiser for a young lady like you, Miss Brooks, not to see him at all. Huh? There are just a few things I want to know, Doctor, before... Uh, Dr. Tarouk. Uh... Oh, Rodney, will you come here? Yes. This imposing but very competent gentleman is the male nurse I've hired to be with Mr. Burke, when it is impossible for me to be present. Oh, I... He's acting quiet now, Doctor. Good. Very good. We can go in uh, this way, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. There he is. Hey, Joe. Danny boy. <laughs> Don't you have anything to say for yourself? What did you do? Lose your harmonica? <laughs> oh, George. Yeah. Let me wipe Mr. Burke's forehead. Yes, Doctor. You can see, Mr. Valentine, what an effort it costs your friend to try to speak. I'm not blind, Doctor. Permit me to explain. The blow he must have received in that accident has injured the tiny wires that crisscross in the brain. His thoughts cannot get through a form of motor or thief. Well, that's good to know, but it doesn't help Joe. Doctor, does he know what we're talking about? I am quite sure he does not. You see, the wires of the brain that are blocked make it more difficult for him to get his thoughts through. The theory is... Okay, Doctor, but look. Uh, yes, Mr. Bailey. I'm quite sure you're a very competent psychiatrist, but I, I know you won't mind if I have Dr. Hunter, a friend of mine, come in and have a look at Joe. Just a consultation. Very well, if you feel that way. And it might help to look a little more into that... Accident. Anything to help your friend, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Rodney. Yes, Doctor. The other case downstairs I was so interested in, I think the crisis may come even before I expected. Uh, would you mind being there to do what is necessary? Then let me know exactly what happened. Huh? I'll take care of everything, Good. Doctor. Try talking to him again, George. Hey, look, you big oaf. Stop holding on to me. You know who I am. Hey, we got a lot of old times to talk about. You know me, Valentine. <laughs> oh, I suppose it's no use. Hey, how is it, Dr. Tarouk, that Joe was able to walk when he came home to his wife, and now he's flat on his back and can't use his hands or his legs? I thought he was being cured. It is my hope to arrest the process of the paralysis. Yeah? To shield him from emotional disturbances. Rid his mind of fear. Fear? What fear? Joe was never afraid of anything in his life. This is a different kind of fear. The fear of becoming a mental basket case with no future and no hope. Don't oh, cut it out, Doctor. Mr. Valentine. I was just stating the facts. To have and to hold from this day forward, so death us to part. What are you trying to say, Doc? I'm just the best man with a photographic memory. Oh, I know how you feel about Joe this and Laura. Death, Brooksy, those two should be together. Something's got to be done about it. Look, do yourself a favor, George, and listen to me. This is something you don't know anything about. You're no psychiatrist. No, no, you listen to me, Angel. I know Joe looks as though his head was full of nuts and bolts, but he recognized me. What do you mean? We used to have a way of winking at each other, just to say, keep your skin on, brother. This man's war will be over someday. Well? Well, that's what he was giving me back there. I know it. Are you sure you aren't imagining something you want to believe? I don't care for that oily doctor, Brooksy, and I care less for that overgrown meatball Rodney hovering over Joe every minute of the day. I just have a feeling he's not getting the right chance. You can't let it be a question of feelings, darling. Believe me. <laughs> wow. Golly, me too. Oh, a fine place to get a blowout. A few more yards and we would have gone pitching into that valley. Hey, wait a minute, Brooksy. Don't open that door. Get down. George, what's the matter with you? Maybe that wasn't a blowout. What? Just playing safe. Well, there doesn't seem to be anyone around now. You stay where you are, Angel. I'll take a look-see. Did you find anything? Yeah. A neat bullet hole in that tire. What? Somebody shot at us from those rocks up there. But who could it be? It'd have to be somebody who knew we'd be coming back this way. Bring your deduction, Brooksy. But we'll go into that later. Right now, we fix a flat and then get back to town. Hello? Yes, he's here. 
here just uh-huh. a moment. It's Walker, financial editor of the Bulletin, Good. returning yeah. your call. Good. Yeah, uh-huh. You, oh, hold it a second, Walker, huh? Look, Claire, take this down as I give it to you. Okay. Go on, shoot. Uh-huh, yeah. Kessling, export and import, fined $50,000 six weeks ago, smuggling diamonds what? and a shipment of face powder. Since then, out of business, gave up corporate charter. Yeah, thank you, Walker. That was very helpful. Goodbye. George, what have we gotten into? A very touching little situation, Brooksy. The great big corporate heart of Kessling Limited bleeding for one of its employees who was hurt. Yeah. In fact, it keeps on bleeding now, long after it ceased to exist. Because it was caught smuggling diamonds, no less. Well, how do you think Joe fits into all this? I don't know yet. But right now, we're picking up Dr. Hunter and going back to Hillcrest Sanitarium. Let him take a look at Joe. Yeah, Doc? What'd you find out, Dr. Hunter? I took a good look at your friend, George, and had a long talk with Dr. Taruk. Well, Frank? In Taruk's place, I, uh, I'd have to diagnose the case exactly as he has. Oh. Motor aphasia. Now, progressive paralysis. The whole thing apparently started from some severe shock. I see. Well, now I don't know what to do. His wife told me if we found anything wrong to get him out of here. He's getting all the proper care, as far as I can see. Frankly, I wouldn't suggest that he be moved in his present condition. Okay. Okay, Frank, you know what you know and I know what I know. Now, Maybe George... I'm wrong about Taruk as a doctor, I mean. But there are too many other things wrong about this setup, including that bullet in my tire. Yes, and I still say Joe Burke was winking at me. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. Batter up, it's baseball season again. And here's a seasonal gift for you. It's a 48-page handbook of baseball. The title is Batter Up. To get your free copy, just ask for Batter Up at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. This guide to baseball fundamentals was written by Bert Dunn, former pro. It has 45 illustrations and photos. Boys will be keen about it. Batter Up tells how to play each position, pitching, catching, fielding, and how to bat. Batter Up is available at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you go through the war with a fellow who becomes your buddy. You lose sight of him, and suddenly his wife shows up saying he's in the sanitarium, the mental case. You try to see what it's all about, a bullet comes at you from nowhere. More than that, you're told your buddy is getting the best possible care. You're not convinced, so you decide to dig deeper. In George's case, that means going with Claire to the customs service to have a chat with one of the agents. Now, there really isn't much to it, Mr. Valentine, just what you see in this folder. Uh-huh. What does it say, George? Nothing we didn't know before, Brooksy. Kessling Limited tried to smuggle in diamonds, caught with their carrots down and so forth. Well, I don't know what you expected to find, but compared to some of the stunts we run up against, this wasn't anything too brilliant. Apparently not. The company's out of business now. Now, we've had people trying to get diamonds through in glass eyes and wads of chewing gum almost every way. Finding them in boxes of face powder, well, <laughs> maybe they thought it was so obvious they'd get buying. Yeah, maybe. Face powder, Brooksy. Why didn't it hit us before? Of course. Joe gave Laura a box of face powder. What's that? Yeah, it's not important, at least not yet. Uh, say, tell me something, Craven. Yes? What happens to the rest of the cargo when you catch people smuggling? Well, we have regular custom sales like an auction. In fact, there's one tomorrow. Oh, that's very interesting. It'll be held in one of those loft buildings down on Fayette Street. There's a public notice in the papers today. Good enough. Come on, Brooksy. Uh, thanks a lot for your trouble. Oh, don't mention it. George, I think when Joe gave Laura that box of powder, he was trying to tell her about the smuggling his company was doing. Could be, Brooks. He could be. But maybe we'll know more about that tomorrow. Young lady, you and I are going to an auction. Thousand boxes of face powder, quality second grade, trade name, Cleopatra's Secret. 
Shortage shade. Now, well, what do I hear? The whole lot isn't worth a hundred bucks, Pussy, but here I go and we'll see what happens. Three hundred dollars, Mr. Auctioneer. How uh, much did you say? Three hundred. If you get stuck with all that pot, I don't know how we're going to get it out of here. Well, I don't suppose there'll be any more beds, so... Uh, Four hundred. George. Yeah, no, Angel. I'm going to hit it again just to make sure. Five hundred. Six hundred. What was it? Six hundred. The uh, gentleman who said five hundred, you uh, got another bid, sir? Not me. Count me up. Okay, if the gentleman who bid six hundred... No one ever did find out Cleopatra's secret, Brooksy. What do you say we go downstairs and see if we can't make history? <laughs> George, it's getting dark. Let's make believe it's dinner, and I'll go down to that lunch wagon and get us a couple of containers of coffee. Okay, but hey, quarter books. Huh? That little black truck over there. They're loading something into it. Cleopatra's secret. Hey, you see any name on the truck? I can't. Oh, no, there isn't any name. Oh, I should have known better than to ask. They would have thought of that. Okay, take it away. Look, see, we're off again. <laughs> Keep a good half a block behind him, just like this. Darling, I never want to see another warehouse as long as I live. You could at least put some lights in the window. Yeah, and some fluffy organy curtains. The only light I'm interested in right now, Angel, is that little red one up ahead. It's turning the corner. Hey, a dead-end street, no truck. But we were right behind them. The truck can't just disappear into thin air. There's only one warehouse on this whole street. Yeah, and it's all boarded up. Hey, that big overhead door could have been up. Just waiting for that truck to get in and then close down. Well, I can't think of any other explanation except magic. Yeah, well, we're not going to go ringing any doorbells and tip our mitt. <laughs> Look out! Get out of here. That truck came from that warehouse. This is getting monotonous. It's been used for clay pigeons twice in two days. Hey, Booksy. Yes? Take a good look at that street sign under the lamp and yes. remember it. Listen to this, Brooksy. All the dope on that warehouse on Barrow Street. It's owned by the Fallon Trading Company. So? And the offices and stockholders of Fallon are the same as those of the late Kessling Limited, including the very kindly Mr. Kessling Laura told us about. George, I can't make head or tails out of this. Why would they go and buy up all that old whiff of safe powder? I don't have the answer, Brooksy, but maybe Laura has. That's why we're going over and see her right now. To you. Oh, I don't know, really, Chris. Something hit me. Well, didn't you see who it was? No, I, I was sitting here waiting for a call from you, and then I, I don't have anything except waking up on the floor. George, this place is in a shower. Well, they didn't take anything. What's that? No, I, I looked all around. My pocketbook with almost $100 in it. Oh, my jewelry. Oh, that's still there on the dresser. Uh huh. Oh, what about Joe? Tell me what that doctor friend of yours said. Did he think there was any hope? Of course there's hope. You've got to believe that. There's every hope, Laura. But tell me something. Where did you put that box of face powder Joe gave you? Powder? Yes, yes, you remember. You told us about it. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I just opened it and then I put it in that drawer over there. Yeah, I'm sure of it. It isn't here now. Laura, listen. That firm Joe worked for was a smuggling ring. Diamonds. What are you saying? Joe'd never be mixed up in anything like that. I didn't say he was. But as far as we know, there could have been a fortune in gems in that box of powder he gave you, and the one moment Dr. Tarok left you two alone. What does all this have to do with Joe? That's all I care about. George, you don't think the sanitarium, the auction sale, the warehouse, all that was a part of a search for something that was here all the time? Oh, Claire, I'm tired of guessing. I feel like a dime being pushed around on a shuffleboard. What do you mean? Somebody is in an awful hurry about getting something done, trying to meet a deadline. What about Joe? That's what makes me think. Tarok wasn't too worried about me bringing in another doctor to look at Joe. How does this prove that? The important thing was to keep me from snooping around, interfering with their schedule. That was the reason for the double talk with Rodney and the pot shot at us. What schedule, George? What are you talking about? Something's coming off and coming off soon. Look, stay here with Laura, Angel. I've developed a sudden interest in boats. Incoming and outgoing. Again, Valentine. Yeah, Craven, the Customs Service and I are getting to be just like that. I'll be right with you as soon as I clear this manifesto. All right, Daddy, you can put that shipment through. Hey, look, fella, this is really important, and time is what we don't have the most of. Huh? 
Oh, if you still got that Kessling deal, I know. No, mind, no, I... no. Same people, but a different name. As far as you know, is there anything coming through for the company known as uh, File and Trading? No, I don't know, but I can soon find out. Here, just a minute. Here, file. Oh. Well? No, I don't see anything. Are yet. you sure? Everything points. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Hey, here it is. I missed it because the boat's already in. Uh-huh. Sank it out there in the harbor. Has the cargo been cleared yet? No, that's scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, what's Farland bringing in? Uh, three crates of powdered cocoa beans from the West Indies. Shipping in on the Pandora, Peruvian registry. Captain Martin. No, no, we can skip that, Craven. How soon can we get out to the Pandora? Why, tomorrow we'll I be told unloaded. you, Kessling and Farland are one and the same trading company. Hey, I think I see what you mean, Valentine. We'll take a speedboat, get right out there to the Pandora. <laughs> Come on, Valentine. Well, what can I do for you? I thought you weren't ready for us until tomorrow. There's something special turned up, Skipper. Yeah, specifically powdered cocoa beans from Marlin Company. Mm-hmm. Maybe oh, this trip. Those are some of their crates right here on deck. Okay. Let's try this one for a start. So, what are you fellas looking for, anyway? Carrots, Captain. Huh? Are you kidding? Diamonds, Captain. Oh. Now, you feel around that side, Valentine. I'll take this. Okay. Oh, then, eh? I thought I knew them all. That's no one on me. All right, Craven. Here we are. Huh? Yeah, it's a beauty, too. Take a look at it. Hey. Oh, nice size. I wonder how many more we're going to find. Oh, just enough, but not too many. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, look, Craven. Can I take a sample of this cocoa? Just enough for a cup, let's say? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Help yourself. I doubt if they'll miss it when we auction this stuff off. Uh, thanks again for the tip, Valentine. Oh, you're very welcome. But don't be surprised if I get in touch with you again. Well, Mr. Ross, what's the verdict? What does the chemical analysis show? <laughs> Powdered cocoa, huh? Oh, never mind the suspense. What did you find? Oh, there is cocoa here, all right. But mixed with something that sells for roughly $7,000 a pound. Dope. $7,000 a pound. No wonder Kessling and the boys could afford to use diamonds for window dressing. Uh, what's that? Oh, it'd take too long to explain. Thanks. And remind me to submit your name for the Nobel Prize. What do you want, Valentine? Out of my way, Rodney. You can't go in there. Nobody sees Burke. Dr. Taruk's orders. You're a sucker for Taruk's orders, aren't you? Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have missed me when you took a shot at my car on the road yesterday. Huh? I was just waiting for that big yap to open my door so I could... Rodney, what is those? Greetings, Dr. Taruk. What have you done, Mr. Valentine? The scene should speak for itself. And if you don't want to join Rodney, you'll just sit right down on that bench. Maybe you should be a patient here, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yeah, sure. I got a persecution complex. I can't rest. I can't sleep. I see things. I have bad dreams. I'm afraid there's no hope for me until I hear you and your friends try to explain more than a million bucks worth of dope. I... I... I have nothing to say. When the police and the customs men get here, Dr. Taruk, you'll have plenty to say. How oh, can you beat that, Valentine, using diamonds for a smokescreen? Yep, Craven, that was the racket. They plant the diamonds, not too expensive ones, of course, in case the shipping is open. If they're found, nobody looks any further. Then they pay the fine. Then they buy up the supposedly worthless stuff at the auction for peanuts and make themselves a million. Uh, tell me, uh, how did that friend of yours in the sanitarium fit into all this, Valentine? Well, as I get it, Joe found out what Kessling was doing and was going to talk. All that stuff about an accident in Egypt was a bunk. Now, they gave him a brutal going over. When he came out of it, he had what a psychiatrist so pompously called functional neuroses induced by severe blows on the head. Well, they probably meant to kill him. Sure, but why take chances? There might be investigations. Now, they figured it was better this way. The rook could see to it that Joe didn't snap out of it until this shipment came through, and they'd all take it on the land. That was their deadline. <laughs> How do you like your new barracks, soldier? <laughs> oh, don't try too hard to talk, Joe. We always used to understand each other without too many words. I don't know how we'll ever be able to thank you, Claire. Dr. Honey says 
They're going to be all right. Uh, George, what about that wedding present? You know, the one the best man forgot to give? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, Joe. You and Laura ran out on me so fast that day in camp, I didn't get a chance to give you the usual set of toilets or a percolator or something. Well, uh, now you can at least be the messenger some good news that may make up for that. This customs man told us. It says right in the book, anyone instrumental in thwarting a smuggling attempt is entitled to 25% of what the Treasury gets on dutiable goods. Yeah. And those diamonds don't come cheap, you know. That's right, Joe. You're really the guy who was uh, instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> At ease, soldier. Hey, you know, Brooksy, this time I'm sure he winked. <laughs> And now, a message of importance to motorists. It's a safe bet that along with these first days of spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love, but it's also a safe bet that every motorist's fancy has already turned to thoughts of the open road. If you're making weekend trips at this season with frequent starts and stops for the family car, here's something worth knowing. When you've got Chevron Supreme gasoline in your tank, you get instant action every time you press the starter. It's a premium gasoline that's tailored to the season of the year and to each different altitude zone in the West. Besides saving you a lot of grinding, starting wear, Chevron Supreme gives your car speedy pickup in your stop-and-go traffic, and it assures full power for rugged hill climbing. Best of all, you're never far from Chevron Supreme gasoline. Throughout the West, you can get it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, here we are. Now, don't you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. That Rene woman brings out the fishwife in me. Anything can happen. Well, go on now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, okay. So good to me. Well, now for Rene. I wish I'd let my fingernails grow. The adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Paul Fries, Jack Christian, Dick Ryan, Herb Vigran, and Joe Duvall. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.